welcome who come in friendship, who long for genuine community. May you be graciously received here as your authentic self. Welcome who come in curiosity, full of questions, or simply open. May you embrace wonder and encounter new delights. Welcome who come heavy with fatigue, weary from the troubles of this world or the troubles of your particular life. May you rest and be safe in this sacred space. Welcome those who come with joy for flowing rivers and gentle breezes, for changing skies and great trees. May the grace of the world leave a lasting imprint on you. Welcome who come with thanks for the altruism of the earth and the gift of human care. May your grateful heart overflow and bless those around you. Come, let us celebrate together this wondrous life. As is our custom, we light candles, candles for personal joys, personal sorrows. So if you would like to light a candle, you may do so at this time. Please stand and body our spirit for our spoken affirmation. We light this chalice to celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, to reaffirm the historic pledge of religion, to seek that justice which transcends mere legality and moves toward the resolution of true equality, and to share that love which is ultimately beyond even our cherished reason that love which unites us all. The words, if you need them, are in the order of faith. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in freedom, and to help one another. 
You may be seated. Our opening thought this morning comes from the public radio station, KERA. And it was published or was recited last December. Psychologists say that loneliness and social isolation were prevalent prior to COVID-19, and now the pandemic is exacerbating an already serious problem. In 2021, Charlotte Crawford lost her husband of 40 years and then two adult children to COVID-19. At my son's wake, my husband died. The morning of my husband's funeral, my daughter passed. So I did three funerals in three weeks. On the February night that her son died, Crawford was alone in her home. The winter storm had left her without any power. She reached out to her pastor, M.L. Dorsey, at the True Believers of Christ Community Church in Balt Springs outside of Dallas. What grabbed me was she said, I'm sitting in the dark here with my phone as the light and no one is here with me. The pastor drove 12 miles on the icy roads to be near her. Several months later, he's still making sure that Crawford doesn't feel alone. He set up a care ministry at his church, and two members of the church check on her multiple times a week. Healthcare professionals say loss and loneliness can quickly spiral into depression and take a toll on physical health as well. We know that our emotions are linked to our heart health, says Dr. Ann Navar. She specializes in preventative cardiology at Parkland Hospital in Dallas. She said when people experience trauma, their heart just stops working like it should. There's a syndrome called Takasubo cardiomyopathy, or broken heart syndrome, says Navar. A study in the Journal of Public Health show that a person's risk of death is 66% higher within the first 90 days when a spouse passes away. Navar said that's why it's important for doctors to screen for depression and loneliness. Who do they have in their life to help them take their medicines, to get to appointments, to support them during these very challenging times? Crawford said that her heart is broken, but her family, her friends, and her church are helping her stay alive. It's weird, she says, but it's okay. I know I'm not alone. How far can reach a smile? How high a helping hand can lift? How far is far enough to give? Is there a way to learn just how a kindness speaks? Or where it goes, should love be caught to hold? For God pours out this love in all that lives through God, we see that life can never cease to give. If we 
then think our small amount of help would not go far, and so don't give, would we still live? Loneliness, our speaker, Tendayaka, notes, is not just an idea, a concept, or a thought. It's also a feeling. She cautions us to not let our Unitarian Universalist fondness for thinking, doubt, and argumentation disconnect us from our feelings. While community is powerful, we must also learn to be confident within ourselves and our feelings. She is titled, her discourse, Love After Love, inspired by the poem of the same title by Nobel Prize winning poet Derek Walcott. Love After Love by Derek Walcott. The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome and say sit here eat you will love again the stranger who was yourself give wine give bread give back your heart to itself to the stranger who has loved you all your life whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life. Join me in a moment of silence. Yeah. 
We gather together in church on Sunday mornings to measure our life in love. We take down from the shelf our feelings of hope and care, love and compassion, joy and delight. We take down the photographs, the desperate notes, and we peel our own image from the mirror. We measure our life in daylight, sunsets, midnights, cups of coffee, laughter, and so much more as seasons of love because love is the doctrine of our church. We sit and feast on our life every Sunday morning so that our minds and our bodies, our thoughts and our feelings, in laughter and strife, are measured in love. Three things are particularly important to me when I think about how we, as Unitarian Universalists, measure our seasons of love. I focus our attention here on the word think because we are a faith community that loves to think. You know the jokes about us. What do you do if you put two Unitarian Universalists together? What do you get? Three opinions. What are our two major sacraments? Doubt and argument. We love to laugh at ourselves because we are a people who love to laugh. We find delight, divine delight in our life. We love our vulnerable, endearing, quirky humanity. So let's focus on three things this morning about our seasons of love as Unitarian Universalists. First, let's pay attention to what happens to us when doubt and reasoning when thinking and argument become sacraments for us in the quest for truth in such a single-minded way that we forget that love is the doctrine of our church. I discovered what happened to us happens to us when our attention focuses only on thinking several years ago when I attended a cocktail party in honor of René Descartes, the father of modern philosophy. Philosophers from all over the world attended this gala event in celebration of the man who made reason the scientific foundation for knowledge about humanity, God, and the world. Descartes showed up for the event, which astonished all of us because he died more than three and a half centuries ago. Not wanting to miss the chance to talk with him, the guests formed a line and patiently waited for this unexpected opportunity to chat with the man who concluded that human beings are, at core, thinkers. I think, therefore, I am, Descartes famously said. Descartes thus proved, in his own skeptical age, that there was something in life no one could ever doubt, because doubting itself is a form of thinking. Human beings are thinking things, period. I stood in line for an hour, patiently awaiting my turn to talk to this great man. But alas, the host of the event noticed that Descartes' cocktail glass was empty and rushed to his side, saying, Monsieur Descartes, would you like another cocktail? I think not, Descartes said, and he disappeared. When we focus our attention only on thinking to measure the seasons of our lives, we ignore, as the poet Derek Walcott reminds us, the stranger who has loved us all our life and who knows us by heart. We ignore the body of our feelings, and when we do this often enough, our bodies do not disappear we disappear as whole selves. When we focus our attention only on thinking to measure the seasons of our lives, we become as if thinkers. Neurologist Antonio Damasio describes this condition in his book Descartes' Era, Emotion, Reason, and the Human Brain. Damasio tells us that When we become as if thinkers, 
We act like his patients who have suffered brain injuries that make it impossible for their minds to have access to their own body's feelings. His patients, in other words, think about their bodies as objects of inquiry rather than think within their bodies through compassionate engagement. Western philosophers like Descartes, Damasio concludes, seem to assume that the natural condition of the mind lacks direct access to its own body's feelings and needs. We gather together on Sunday mornings to measure our lives in love. We do this each Sunday to measure our lives in love again. Thus, second, when we become as if thinkers, we become disembodied souls. We become lonely souls. We become estranged from our own feelings. We lose touch with our feelings of being held by life itself. We lose touch with our feelings of being part of the web of life our feeling of falling in love with life itself, our feeling of being loved by life, come what may. These feelings have not left us. We have left them. And as a consequence, we are bereft. We are lonely people. Here's the good news about our loneliness. Loneliness is more than an idea. It's also a feeling, a longing for what's missing in our lives. Love. So if we feel lonely, we are in this very moment of longing more than as if thinkers. We ourselves longing to reconnect with the stranger within us. We are persons who long to measure our life in daylight, sunsets, midnights, cups of coffee, laughter, and so much more as seasons of love. We are persons longing to make connection to ourselves and others because we know that love is the doctrine of our church and we strive ever anew to feel with our bodies what we affirm in our minds. Love. Here's what we know about loneliness in America. It was epidemic before the coronavirus pandemic, and now it's worse. According to a January 2020 survey of 10,000 Americans, 61% of adults over 18 say they are lonely. That's three out of every five persons. Most Americans felt physically isolated, lacked social support systems, and had few meaningful social interactions before the shelter-in-place protocols began. And now, because we are sheltering in place, the loss of the full presence of others is taking a heavy toll on us. Now, in this time of heightened loneliness, we find new ways to gather together in small groups, to share and listen to the details, texture, content, feelings, and ideas of each other's personal experiences. We find these new ways because we are Unitarian Universalists. We never forget that love is the doctrine of our church. And if given the space, we step forward to measure all the seasons of our life in love. Consider what happened several years ago when I spoke to congregants in one of our New England churches about forming small groups that embody our interdependence. In these small groups, persons measure their life in daylight, sunshine, midnight, cups of coffee, laughter, and so much more as seasons of love shared together. After I finished my formal presentation, I asked those present if they might be willing to meet together once in small groups over a meal. Just try it, I said, and talk about 
for emotional needs. One of the most respected elder statesmen of the church stood up and slowly walked to the front of the assembly, faced his fellow congregants, and said he was interested in joining such a group. He wanted something like this. He had wanted something like this for years, he said, because he was lonely. I do not have any friends, he finally confessed. Many persons expressed incredulity. How could he be lonely? He was a revered and beloved member of the congregation, a pillar of the church. The man spoke again, saying, Every man in this room who is my age knows what I am talking about. Our social upbringing has taught us not to talk about our feelings. We are not supposed to be emotionally vulnerable or close to anyone except our lives our wives. He had stepped forward because he no longer wanted his feelings to be invisible. Our loneliness and our invisibility are described by John Riley in the lyrics for Mr. Cellophane, which was performed in church a few months ago. The excitement generated in the sanctuary during the performance of this song brought countless congregants to their feet shouting and applauding the lyrics. Everybody gets noticed now and then, unless, of course, that personage should be invisible, inconsequential me. Cellophane, Mr. Cellophane Man. Should have been my name, Mr. Cellophane, because you can look right through me, walk right by me, and never know I'm there. We create new small groups in this church so that no one looks right through you. We create the space so that everyone sees you and gives you the space you need to be heard into speech, to be seen, affirmed. And loved. There's another kind of invisibility in this church that we attend to so that everyone sees you and gives you the space you need to be heard into speech, to be seen, affirmed, and loved. This invisibility is how black bodies disappear. This loss of black bodies was described in Ralph Ellison's mid-20th century novel, The Invisible Man. The nameless black protagonist describes this particular kind of invisibility in the opening paragraph of the novel. And so he says, I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood ectoplasm. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, of fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. Millions of white Americans, now for the first time, can see us. The public murder of George Floyd on May 25th by a Minneapolis police officer who kept his knee on George Floyd's neck for 7 minutes and 46 seconds made it impossible not to see George Floyd and or to hear him. Everyone also saw the casual expression of the white policeman's face. We saw his hand nonchalantly kept in his pant pocket. We saw his mouth slightly opened and curled into a defiant smile. We saw his sunglasses resting on his head so that everyone could peer into his eyes, and he acted like a hunter posing with his trophy kill. The crime scene horrified millions of white and black Americans and sent millions of persons into the street because they saw an unvarnished, form of white racism against black Americans. Everyone had just witnessed one way a black body gets disappeared in a police state. We are killed. 
Black Americans have always known we live in a police state. We get incarcerated by the police and accosted by countless white Americans for the crime of driving, jogging, walking home, bird watching, playing, or sleeping while black. But now white America is learning to see the battered bodies. A majority of white Americans have finally realized that we do indeed live in a police state. Mr. Cellophane Man and the Invisible Man are now visible in America and in this church. And as a result, something quite extraordinary is about to happen here in this church, in our church, because Mr. Cellophane, Mr. Cellophane and the Invisible Man and so many others have gathered together to read and discuss Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, a story of justice and redemption with members of the Racial Equity Task Force. In this book, Stevenson, who is one of the most respected and influential attorneys on behalf of the poor and dispossessed in America, describes what Mr. Cellophane Man and the invisible man have in common, suffering. And he cautions readers not to compare the suffering, writes Stevenson. We share the condition of brokenness, even if our brokenness is not equivalent. But our shared brokenness connects us. Our brokenness is the source of our common humanity, the basis of our shared search for comfort, meaning, and hearing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. It is here that we find the meaning, the meeting point between white and black invisibility in this church. In an unjust world, everybody suffers. Everybody gets compromised. Everybody's feelings are numbed, enraged, blindsided, or disappear in some way. We create new small groups in this church, in our church, so that no one looks right through you. We create the space so that everyone sees you and gives you the space you need to be heard into speech, to be seen and affirmed and loved. We do this work together because love is the doctrine of our church. Everything for us is turned into a season of love, a way we measure love as we grow in harmony with the divine. This morning, we have thought about ourselves as as-if thinkers. This morning, we have paid attention to what happens to us when our thinking loses touch with our feelings. We become lonely. And we have affirmed that our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and, sus nurtures and sustains our capacity for, com for compassion. This capacity for compassion is our season of love. It's the way, it's our way. We measure love in daylight, sunsets, midnights, cups of coffee, laughter, and so much more as seasons of love. When we measure our life in love, Connection for us becomes a spiritual practice because our loneliness and suffering, our brokenness and vulnerabilities are now measured in love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor, theologian, and anti-Nazi -Nazi dissident in Nazi Germany, put it this way in his letters and papers from prison. Learn to regard people less in light of what they do or omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. And thus my final point this morning. Derek Walcott in his poem, Love After Love, predicts 
that the time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. In our Sunday services, this time has already arrived. We welcome the estranged, lonely, and invisible parts of ourselves back into our lives. We gather together in church on Sunday mornings, virtually and actually, and measure our life in love. No one remains invisible when we gather together. We feast together. We celebrate our lives. Every season for us becomes a season of love. So when someone tells us that they know pain, loneliness, loss, fear, and dismay, but do not know the feeling of being sustained by a love that is wider, deeper, and infinitely vaster than their sorrows, we hear those words as a commission to love to create community, and to heal. One at a time in personal relationships, ten at a time in love beyond belief groups, hundreds at a time in our congregations, hundreds of thousands at a time in our religious movement, millions at a time as we take our commission deeper and deeper into humanity's hearts as a justice-loving people who will transform the world. Every Sunday morning, We take one more step and measure every movement, every moment of our lives as a season of love. The offering is a sanctament of the free church. It's supported by the voluntary generosity of all of us. The offering will now be given and received in grateful appreciation of our shared hopes and values. The bowl awaits. Without ever mentioning it by name, Tandaica made numerous allusions to the musical Rent, 
and how we measure our life in love. Jonathan Larson, the author and composer of the production that would soon become a Broadway sensation, died suddenly of an undisclosed heart condition the night before the show's triumphant opening. Seasons of Love is a touching summary of the love among a group of friends. In other words, among and within a community. I invite you now to stand and body your spirit for the benediction and extinguishing the chalice. Blessed is the path on which we travel. Blessed is the body that carries you upon it. Blessed is your heart that has heard the call. Blessed is your mind that discerns the way. Blessed is the gift that you will receive by going. Truly blessed is the gift you will become on the journey. May you go forth in peace. Please join me in saying the words to extinguish the chalice. The words are in the morning program. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are. 